Hello, thank you for joining my presentation about a very free ClickSense installation. My name is Sebastian Linzer. I'm a senior technical support engineer here at the Click Support. I have been with Click for one year and seven months, and my main focus is deployment and infrastructure issues for all kinds of Click products, but the main focus is on ClickSense. My agenda for today is to show you possible deployment scenarios, walk through a ClickSense enterprise installation, and to sum up some things to remember before you start one of the ClickSense Enterprise installations. To really get a grip of what you need to install ClickSense very free, you need to understand the different deployment scenarios. So let's go ahead to the next slide, which basically shows a few things you need to know about a ClickSense Enterprise system. If you are talking about a ClickSense Enterprise system on Windows, we have a few components which come here together. The first one is the hub, which is basically your main area as a developer and a business analyst to get your statistics and applications out in a graphical presentation. Then we have the management console, which is the admin tool in the background to get everything together under the hood. You can here set up your proxies, virtual proxies, security rules, you can assign licenses, sync users from Active Directory or other sources. How is this working? That is done by the ClickSense proxy, which is our own web server, which uses the ClickSense engine to do the in-memory associative data indexing so that your applications can be displayed. We have then also the scheduler service, which is the engine for application reloads, as well as the repository service, which is talking to the centralized database and then sending and receiving information from that one. All your applications are stored on a centralized storage and they are usually having the format QVF while you have them in ClickSense Desktop. As soon as you have them imported in the QMC, you will see they don't have any extensions on the file share, but it's still the same format, even though there is not the extension added and the files will be there before they will be loaded into memory. Our product loads all into memory and keeps the last selection, so you will have the best performance in doing things. So now the question comes up, why do I need to bother about all those services? Yeah, that is because we have different scenarios and you can scale ClickSense in a way that you can have more than one node. You can, for example, have a central node and a RIM node connected to it where you put some other services on which are not on the central node or services which you want to have in addition for purposes of load balancing or user separation. Let's see in this slide here some examples. You see totally on the bottom we have the central node which basically has every single service, proxy, engine, scheduler, repository service, repository database, and the application file system. If we then have a consumer node, we basically only need the proxy, the engine, and the repository service to talk to the database. This one can be there for just the business analytics user. While the developer node can have a different purpose, it can also have the possibility to create new apps so that you can use a separation between the users actually editing applications and reloading applications or create new applications and the users who only do self-service consumption of the applications. You can have a different scheduler node or multiple scheduler nodes to load balance your reloads. If you have massive data you want to load into your applications, just spin up a few more scheduler nodes, which then just need an engine, scheduler, and repository to be able to do reloads at different times and with less performance impact for your proxy nodes. So what is then the smallest deployment we have in a ClickSense enterprise deployment? That is a single node server. That means everything you have is on the same machine. You can have the application share on this machine. You can have it on a file server. That is fine. But in principle, you would say everything is on the same machine. This would work for small and medium-sized companies, depending on how intensive your users are using the system. If you then see they need more data throughout the day without losing their selections, it's maybe time to go to a two-node environments. And there you have a central and a rim node. Here we would split the scheduler on the central node and the proxy and engine on the rim node. 
Now, of course, we would also have an engine on the central node, but uh, for places, it's not written here. It's just as a small symbol down there. Uh, the thing here is now we can, as I mentioned before, split the reloads so that it does not have any performance impact on the proxy node. That means we can also do reloads throughout the day while the users are still using their proxy. If you get even bigger in your deployment, you might start thinking about load balancing two or more proxy nodes. So that actually if one goes down, users would still be able to use the second one, or in case of a huge amount of users at the same time, they can use both proxies and utilize them perfectly so that none of the engines, engines comes to the capacity limit. And of course, you can uh, scale up our installation to the maximum. There is no limit in how many RIM nodes you can join. That is free to your imagination and only limited by the throughput of your network resources. In February 2019, we also implemented multi-cloud. We have now the possibility to push out apps to a cloud scenario which you would spin up in a small container, and then you can have an app and an engine available on the cloud so your users can do selections away from your own proxy or on places where you need to have the app published, but uh, it should be available from outside your organization. The way until now was only then to open up your ClickSense server to the internet, and that one is a step beyond that. Important here to know is you need to have a single license across the deployment, which is called signed license. What exactly the difference is, we will come to later on. And the uh, platform technologies for our multi-cloud product are as following. Linux is the bottom of it, used with containers, for example, by Docker, and you can use Kubernetes for the orchestration to spin them up in a larger scale. This can be deployed on the Click Cloud services, which are our internal cloud services we will offer, also based on an Amazon deployment. Azure, you can of course go to Amazon directly and have your own instance, or you use Google or any other cloud provider out there. What do I need to do now to prepare for my installation so that it gets very free from the first place? We have seen in a lot of installations in ClickSense uh, lately that the approach to just install it next, next finish has a failure rate of 60 and more percent. So please, if you are planning a ClickSense enterprise deployment, start with our help site. On our help, especially under the point deploy and planning your deployment, you will find all system requirements, ports, supported browsers, architecture, persistence, services, infos about the user account, how to create the file share, what additional security is needed, and a few things about how to proceed with your ClickSense installation. If we, for example, go to the system requirements, you can see in detail how many cores you need, how many space you need, and so on. <clears throat> As we saw on this page for February 2019, we can install it on server 2012, 2012 R2, and 2016. 2019 is out there, but right now our product does not support it. It might work, but it is absolutely not supported in this scenario. You have to think about how much memory you want to give your system. Keep in mind here that an application you develop will at least take four times the amount of the physical storage on disk in the memory when you are working with this application. Processor definition should be at least four cores for the central node, and then keep in mind to have one CPU for each click send service you want to run on the RIM nodes, which you add to the systems in addition. Five gigabyte is only the disk space. Keep in mind here also that we have a lot of uh, space which will be blocked in C program data because all the locks and initial configurations of the send system will be stored in C program data click. Also the local database, if you should uh, choose a local Postgres installation, which is bundled within the product, is written to C program data. 
you need to add a network file share to be able to use shared persistence, which is nowadays the only model which is supported by the ClickSense installation. Before we had synced persistence as well, where all the apps were held in C program data, but this has been moved to a network file share only scenario. And if you want, you can have a standalone Postgres database if you think about high availability, but that is not, that is just an option you can choose. It's not mandatory to proceed with a standalone one. Here we can see that the installation user, which we call service user, can be local or domain, but we recommend for multi-node deployments to have it as a domain user, simply for the fact that the account should be available on every single node where you want to connect later on. This service user needs to have the rights of log on locally, allow the right to run as a service, and the server must be member of the local admin group on the server itself. The ports you can find on the help side. Let's just have a very quick look back on the help. We see that um, if we go one step back, we have ports, and here we have them listed for every single possible service. Definitely what you need is to open 443 on your system, so users from the outside can access the web server later on. And if you have a multi-node deployment system, you should be opening port 4432 and 444, so you can have the database talking to the other node. It is required to have .NET 4.5.2 installed, but recently we have seen that there are some problems after the latest Windows updates on this .NET framework, so it's uh, now better to have 4.7.2. We recommend to have while installing February 2019. And you should have PowerShell 4.0 or later installed on your server system. The reason for that is that uh, in the installer, we run PowerShell scripts to set up things. And if you have a too old version, you have functions which are just not existing in the older versions. Enough for the pre-requirements. We can have a short look before we dive into the installation itself on a demo system. Where would I actually look at the um, things which I mentioned here. For the first, we can start with local security policy. Here, we open local policy and user rights assignment, and we have all the simple things. Allow log on locally. We see the administrators have those rights. The service user is member of local administrator, so that should be fine. Make sure to check those three groups as well, because if the service user would be in the deny group, deny always overrides allow, it might fail. And we have the two down here, which say log on as service, and then we have our account in here. So that is fine. The security options are just one additional step, not really mentioned as a pre-requirement, but in case you would have FIPS enabled by default or the strong key protection encryption, your installer will fail with a nearly 98% certainty. Make sure to disable those two features just for the installation. The other thing to make the service user local admin, the easiest way is to go to computer management. We are the server manager and check in the group administrators to add the user click send service. Back to the slide. What happens when you start the installer? You will see most likely a window that you have to close down a few more additional programs before you can proceed with the installation itself. Please make sure to close the task manager, the MMC consoles you had open, for example, the services view, the um, computer management console that we just opened, and so on. This most likely will not completely break your installation, but it just takes off the availability from you to start and stop services during the installation and like this, um, crash something in the background because you maybe thought the installation is done, but it was not. Once you have closed down everything, you should see this message, your system is ready to install, and then you just hit on next. 
in the next screen, you basically just have one choice. That's the same for a RIM and a central node. You just hit install and it will start the process of unzipping everything for the February 2019 installation. We come to the EULA and here it's of course like this that none of you will most likely read it, but keep in mind, read it at least once through. There are some new text pieces in the February release. So make sure if you haven't read it, over the last years to at least update yourself on it. Then, depending if you want to have a central or a rim node, you have to choose create cluster or join cluster. Create cluster you would use to install the central node from scratch, and then it will give you the uh, option to create a database as well. If you just join the cluster, it thinks that the database is already there, so you just have to specify the IP and the service users for the database in order to join it later on. Next, you will see that there is a server name and your domain suffix filled in. Make sure it is the right one, especially if you install on an Amazon instance. It could happen that you have a different name listed here than what your host name actually is. And that one is important for the authentication part as well. So make sure it matches the host name and domain suffix. Every additional IP you need to open up your system later can be added later on as well via the virtual proxy configuration. Now, in the next step, we come to the point that we actually have to specify the standard values for the local database. If you would have a standalone database already prepared according to the document on the help side, you would, of course, not check the install local da uh, database option, but um, if you just want to proceed with creating an initial one, you can use our options. Keep in mind, our Postgres port is changed from the standard 5532 to 4432, but if you have a local one, a standalone one, both will work just fine. Uh, you fill in the database user, which is usually a ClickSense repository, and the database user password. After this, check the advanced settings. You will notice here that uh, it pre-fills the IPv6 and IPv4 address of your own server. This is fine as long as you have a central node deployment because that node will be able to talk towards the database. If you then want to add additional RIM nodes, make sure you have the whole address space or the single IPs from all the other systems listed in this IP range as well. The max connection setting here is used per node. So keep in mind, if you would have two nodes, you would have to space at least 200 connections and not just 100. We say 100 connections per node as a thumb rule in how much you should put this up when you join additional nodes. Now, as we mentioned already at the beginning, we had to create a file share, basically here using the Microsoft standard in sharing the share with everyone full control, but then on the security side to limit it to the service user and administrators of this server with full access. All the subfolders you see here in create out format will be generated automatically after the installation when the repository starts up the first time. It should be a Windows file share that is important to keep in mind. NAS boxes and such are supported for ClickSense. After you have set up the file share, the next question will be about if you want or don't want the centralized logging option. Centralized logging is a new feature which was recently added to ClickSense, which basically generates all the logs you have on file level also inside a database. If you do not need centralized logging because, for example, you just have a central node, you don't plan to do any RIM nodes, you could skip this feature. It's always possible to set up queue logs later if your deployment gets larger. If you already know that you will have a large scale deployment and you want to be able with apps to read from a database to get your latest statistics over how your nodes in health state or Otherwise, you can just start using this database. And also here is the option to put this one on a standalone database or to let the Sense installer literally generate a new QLEX database for you. 
If you click next on the option and you choose to have a QLock database, you will be presented with a few passwords for the QLock reader and writer user. The writer is, as it says, the user who sends the data back to the database, the reader, the one which reads it out and then prepares it in the monitoring apps. As last, you have to space a repository super user password. This one is important for the fact that you may forget your ClickSense repository password. And in case you do that, you can reset it with this user. So keep this one very secure somewhere. You will only need it during the upgrade or in the initial installation. As we spoke about already, the installation will take place in C program files click sense, and that was what we had on the help side with. It will take approximately five gig of disk space. But every database file which is from the local database will be stored in C program data click sense, and so will be the logs. So make sure to have enough space on the C drive available, not only five gigs. And you can, of course, point the installation location, for example, on the E or D drive, but you will still have the program data things written to the C drive. So even though you might have a one terabyte disk on E, make sure there is enough space on C, otherwise your system will stop eventually. We didn't specify the service user yet. That is what we set up at the beginning. As we mentioned, it needs to be able to log in locally, log in as a service, it should not be in the denied groups and it should have local administrators. So just here specify the domain backslash username and then your account password and click next. In November 2018, we added the possibility to install supported extension bundles, which are basically third party dashboard bundles or visualization bundles, which are fully supported by click. This also is available in the February 2019 release. If you want to use them, make sure you check the supported extension bundles here. There is one option up there which says start the ClickSense services when the setup is complete. Usually you would always leave this one checked. There is only one scenario where you wouldn't do that and that is if you try to restore a ClickSense installation from a backup. In this case, you would have to replace the database after your installation is done and then you don't want to have the services start up before that. If you choose to go on with the bundles, you will be presented with the license for it, which is uh, licensed under the MIT license. And every single extension is listed here. So you could just browse through the list and then you will see what exactly is included in this bundle. You can also browse the help site for more information on those bundles. Now, finally, we can see the installation started. This setup here can take up to 20, 25 minutes, depending on the speed of your PC and network speed and so on. You will see in this process, staging, repository database, repository service, engine, scheduler, client, service dispatcher, proxy, and extensions coming up. If you made everything correct, you will be prompted with a, you have successfully installed ClickSense dialog. If you do something wrong though, you will be presented with this. Oh, what happened here? Maybe I did a bad job explaining all this in the last slides. You can of course now click on the blue text here, view setup lock folder. And in this one, you can search on the latest file without any rollback extension to uh, for the value 16 or three or value space three. This will give you exactly what went wrong in our installation. After you have found out what went wrong, you can always go to our knowledge database for help. Let's see what went wrong in my example. So I spaced my service user as domain QV service. I tried to write to a share, which is called share DC1, and there I have it. My PC is actually called DC1, and then the share is called share. So I misspelled the shared folder. And the error message we got is a little bit longer down in bold, which says you do not have permissions to write on the root folder. And then it rolled back. You will unfortunately see this error just 
right at the end of the installation, we do not have a test yet if the share is writable at the beginning when you actually choose the share. If you have done everything correct, as I did in my second approach, then you will get the best result, which is that the ClickSense Management Console button there is not grayed out, but actually black. That means the proxy has started up, and this might take two minutes to come there after you see that the installation has been completed. And on this point, you are still not done because you need to add a license to actually start using ClickSense. Keep in mind that the first user who is logging into the system will be root admin. So if you install ClickSense somewhere, make sure it's secure that uh, the first one is you which logs in and not somebody else. If you are in the QMC, you will be presented with two options, either the option above, which says you need to use a site license, which is the new license uh, model we have in February 2019. Here is important to know that uh, if you want to use the Click Cloud services with the multi-cloud options, you need to have a site license because this license has to be aligned across every single installation and it needs to be online available. The other version, which you see down below, is the old version model, which we had with the left and control number. You can still use this one, but if you use this old version, you will not have the possibility to add any cloud nodes in your deployment. Now somebody might have wondered, is there not a possibility of installing ClickSense silently? And of course, there is. Everything which we specified now in the last slides, you can also do in a silent script and then just run the installer pointing at the script. How does this work? For this, let's go back to the help site, search here for silent, And you see here how to perform a silent installation. Here is written step by step which parameters you can specify with an example how to use it. And there is mentioned a file spc.config. This one you will find here a little bit longer below on this site. Just copy it out from the help and adjust your values as, for example, the share, the password of your database user, the um, whitelisting of your database connections, and so on. Important here is that everything inside here is case sensitive. So if you delete true and false, do not write it in capital letters because that will make your silent installation fail. But like this, you can distribute central nodes and rim nodes throughout your organization silently. You would then still at the end have to go in once to the QMC and to register it because that is not part of this silent script. So that concludes nearly my presentation for today. I only have a few more takeaway points to leave here. Did you check that the setup user has all the rights before proceeding. Have you created a file share before installing ClickSense? Did you check the ports of ClickSense if they are not blocked? If you wanted to, to check if port 443 is used at your system, just do netstat minus AOM pipe find string 443 and you will see everything in a port which has a 443 inside. Totally on the top we see that something is listening here 1760. Since we are on the sense server and sense is started, it's most likely sense. So let's just go to the task manager here and have a short look if this is the case. So we go to more details in the details pane and we know it's 1760 and yes that's the proxy exit our click sense proxy if this would show anything else like let's say a patchy exit or something or tomcat 
you would know there is a second web server running on this system, and then you need to shut it down before going into sense. Um, did you think about the size about your deployment at the beginning? Because then it's easy to specify everything at the time when you install ClickSense rather than adjusting it later on when you want to do an upsizing or downsizing. And keep in mind to have the right license model fitting your needs. That concludes my presentation for today. Let's go to the question and answer section. Okay, everyone, now it's time for Q&A. Please enter your questions in the Q&A panel on the left side of your console. Sebastian, go ahead and pick out some questions you want to answer. Mm -hmm. We got a question wondering how to set up the antivirus program so that ClickSense works correctly. I can see here that you most likely had to have troubles in the past. It is still this what we have told all the time. Every ClickSense program files folder, the program data click folder, and your shared folder should be taken out of the antivirus scanning. Simply because our data format makes it sometimes um, impossible that antivirus can lock the file while Sense needs a direct access to the file. And in this case, then your application will crash or the engine will restart and the visualizations will become unavailable for your end users for a short amount of time. And all selections that it will be lost. So the best is to have those exclusions in place. If you need this once more, there is an easy way to see that. You would just scroll a little bit longer down here to click knowledge articles and then search for this what you wanted, antivirus click sense. And if I spell antivirus correctly, you should get a hit. Here are all these ex exceptions needed. And then just read through the few articles and you will have your answer to that one. The second one we have, in an upgrade, how to back up sheets and stories shared on QMC, not part of the app. There is also an easy way to do that. It's either on the help or you can search it here. You would just search for a backup of click sense. And then you see here how to Postgres database backup in ClickSense. And you have all the commandos you need to backup your database. If you have a database backup, you have everything what you need to restore your sense in the way it was before. And of course, you will have also a backup of your apps on disk because both those parts make the system complete. Then we have a question here, browsing source folders located on different servers. Is this a challenge via the QMC configuration on uh, Windows Server 2016? And that is not an issue as long as your service user, which is the user which will browse from out the QMC, has access to your uh, servers, you can uh, see every data which there is. What are the um, key directories to backup? What folders can a uh, file be restored in case of issues? So that's best explained on the help. To have it all together, you would go to click Sense 17, then search here after restore or backup. One of those is fine. And you see we have here what needs to be backed up for Sense. It's certificates, the database, and the files. And you have for everything a step-by-step -step guide in how to do it. Nowadays, even with pictures, of course not for the database part, but for the certificate part. So you really see what you need and what you need to address. So just follow the guides and you will be successful. Um, then we had another interesting question. What is the maximum capacity of an app in an enterprise server deployment? 
And this is really just limited by how much resources you have for your system. There is no physical limit as we have in the cloud that we, for example, say 500 megabytes per app if you use uh, the click cloud version which we have out there. But here you can basically have a 36, 100 gigabyte app as long as you have 500 gigabyte RAM inside to even be able to open it, it will be fine. It's however not recommended to have those large apps. The best performance you get if your app is not bigger than 25 gig. Um, then we got some questions here. The ClickSense engine does not respond sometimes. Uh, calculation worked 10 seconds earlier, not guaranteed it will work the second time. This is a difficult issue and there can be many causes to it. The best here is to raise a ticket, send us the log files and we can have a look. Um, then I got one more question. Should we per default always opt out from using central logging if the customer only is using one node? My recommendation here is yes, do it. You don't need to install uh, centralized logging if you are not planning to have more than one node. Then we had one more. <clears throat> Any best practices on the load balancer rules, multi nodes and Postgres share repositories in Azure? Um, if you wanted to use everything in an Azure deployment, then you need to have some additional steps in place. And the best recommendation here is to wait for the April 2019 release because there we did improvements just for the Azure port. There were some services like a standalone Postgres which we are not working from scratch anymore in February 2019. So wait until April is out and then have another look. Okay, Sebastian, can you pick one more question? Sure. Um, when would it be possible to install ClickSense on a Linux platform? Right now, that's not possible. Besides the small containers, uh, we can spin up in Linux, but there are still windows in the bottom to actually handle the engine. Um, it uh, might come in the future, but there is absolutely no time frame yet which we can give you. Thank you for your questions. Thank you, everyone. We hope you enjoyed this session. Thank you to Sebastian for presenting. We always appreciate getting experts like Sebastian to share with us. Here's our legal disclaimer. And thank you once again. Have a great rest of your day.